Okay, perfect. So you might want to minimize. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so Debbie was at the a research scientist at the University of Wisconsin Madison, working with doctors Richard Marsh and Judd Aiken. Her studies combined biochemical analyses of infectious prions with prion infectivity studies in rodents. When chronic wasting disease was first identified in Wisconsin in 2002, CWD became her main research focus with an emphasis on chronic wasting disease genetics and strains. In 2008, she moved to the Center for Prions and Protein Folding Disease at the U of A, where she continues to focus on emergence of chronic wasting disease strains and host range. Her research team has identified several CWD strains with variable host ranges. Debbie was lead on a recently completed Genome Canada project called Systems Biology and Molecular Ecology of Chronic Wasting Disease, a project involving 12 research teams. She teaches Biology 298, Biology 310, which is Biology of Aging, and Biology 409, which is zoonosis. And so with that, I'm pleased to have Debbie talk to us today and give us a lecture today on the impacts of genetics and the environment on chronic wasting disease in deer. Okay. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you, Declan, and thank you to the department for providing beverages and food, because I'm sure that plays a big role in everyone showing up. Um, so um, I would like to talk about uh, a lot of the work I've been doing for probably the almost the last 20 years, 21 years, actually, which is kind of a depressing number. Um, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about what a prion is and why it's important, and then sort of delve into um, the importance of chronic wasting disease, and then give you a very broad overview of the things that we've been doing um, here. And this thing only sometimes works. So because I always forget at the end, I just wanna point out some of the people um, in the lab that have been critical uh, for doing a lot of this work. Um, the strain work has been done, um, a lot of it by Camillo, who's now a research associate. Um, environmental work is being done by El Su, Aradna, Isa, and Deanna. Um, Anthony's been looking at glands and secretions from deer and how they might be important in transmission. Um, Sanghyun does more uh, cell biology, looking at strain evolution. And then Alan and Alicia are former lab members. Alan's now at the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison. Um, he's been a key player in everything we've done for actually the last 20 years. And Alicia is a new faculty member at the University of Zaragoza in Spain, and she was a key driver in moving us in new directions. So prion diseases, as many of you probably know, are neurodegenerative diseases. So the ultimate cause of death is going to be the loss of neurons. They are always fatal. We don't know of any cases of prion disease that don't result in death directly from the infection. We don't have a cure. We've known about prions being an infectious agent since 1982. And so far, we have no way of curing the disease. There's some interesting developments in slowing it, but no cure. And the other key component of prions is that they're really resistant to inactivation. So in the lab, this translates into the fact that we can't get rid of them easily. So we need specific containment measures to make sure that everything is autoclaved, incinerated, um, et cetera. Um, as I'll talk about towards the end, the environmental contamination aspect is huge with prion diseases because there's no, they're not going to go away if they're in the environment. There's actually a whole group of prion diseases. Um, the oldest prion disease um, that's been discussed is scrapie in sheep and goats. It shows up in the literature from as early as 1750. Um, 
And then the one that everyone's probably most familiar with is bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease. It's the reason for the existence of the prion center here, the prion unit in Calgary, et cetera, was the BSE crisis in Canada that had huge economic impacts. There's a few um, lesser known uh, prion diseases in animals. One is uh, transmissible mink encephalopathy. This occurs in farmed mink. The last outbreak was in 1985 in Wisconsin. And for reasons that are somewhat baffling me, we haven't seen any since. Um, feline spongiform encephalopathy is related to BSE from eating contaminated um, beef. It moved into, um, into cats, domestic cats, as well as um, exotic cats at a number of zoos. And then a really, oops, sorry, um, a really weird one showed up a few years ago. There was a report of a spongiform encephalopathy or prion disease in camels in Algeria. It was confirmed as a prion disease by researchers in Italy. We don't know anything more about it. The veterinarian who discovered in Algeria lost his job. There's no access to any of those samples. It's a bit disconcerting because it seems like it's been there for a while. And the camels are also a common source of protein in that area. Then in humans, a um, couple of different uh, prion diseases. The most well-known is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD. This usually presents as a sporadic disease in about one in a million people. So we see in central to northern Alberta, anywhere from one to five cases a year. Variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the prion disease that came from consuming BSE infected beef. So this is the only case, uh, BSE is the only prion disease that's known to be zoonotic. Kuru is from Papua New Guinea. It's now gone. It's an ancient, um, ancient um, prion disease in that once they stopped the um, cannibalistic funeral practices, then the disease hasn't been transmitted within that population. And then there's two genetic forms of the disease, fatal familial insomnia and uh, GSS, I'm not even going to try to say it, I murder it every time. Um, these are both um, mutations in the prion protein, and I'll talk more about the prion protein in a few minutes. So as I mentioned earlier, they're difficult to kill. Um, you can't treat them with um, acids or bases unless you go to like one normal hydroxide for an hour or so. Um, standard sterilization didn't, doesn't work. This is one of our big issues on the prion center. Everything that leaves the prion facility has to be autoclaved at 134. Um, Standards say one hour, University of Alberta says two hours, and we have to have the ticker tape that shows it was at 134 for two hours, or it has to be autoclaved again. So this is uh, just to indicate how difficult it is to get rid of it. And um, um, UV, gamma radiation, et cetera, doesn't work um, to kill a prion. So all of the prions share um, some specific characteristics. They all uh, result in this spongiform degeneration that occurs in various regions of the brain. They are all transmissible to some extent. CWD that I'll talk about is super transmissible. Some of the others like the familial diseases, gerstmann strassler schenker syndrome, um, can be transmitted, but you really have to work hard to do it experimentally. Infection is highest in the brain and spinal cord. We know the lymph system is involved. There's a lot of studies now that are showing that there can be a lot of other tissues um, that um, have um, relatively high levels of infectivity. And when we talk about deer, you'll see that deer actually have it in uh, secretory glands and are shedding. Uh, the classic 
um, hallmark in the lab is the accumulation of an abnormal form of a normal protein. It's called PRPTSE, it's called PRPSC, it's called PRPCWD, and I tend to use them interchangeably, so I apologize in advance for that. They all have long incubation periods. And maybe most importantly, they have a really long preclinical phase. So in humans, um, if you have an infection that leads to uh, CJD um, or for variant CJD, that incubation period is anywhere from 10 to 50 years. The last case of Kuru, um, in Papua New Guinea occurred like 55 years after the consumption of um, cadavers had, had ceased. So the incubation period is huge. Um, cattle, deer, sheep are usually two to three years. Our rodent models are anywhere from 45 days, which is really, really fast in the prion field, to greater than two years. As an example of the extended preclinical, a hamster model that I've used for years, if you inoculate the agent directly into the brain of the animal, it takes them 60 days to get sick. But they're gonna look perfectly normal for 55 of those days. And so there's no way that you would be able to say, this is a sick animal. And the same thing is happening with deer, sheep, cattle, is deer look fine, and then in the last couple of months, they'll go rapidly downhill, but it results in animals being transported, they look healthy, they get to a new area, and now they contaminate that area. Um, so the cool thing about prions is that they are the misfolding and aggregation of a normal protein. So we all have the cellular prion protein. Um, is primarily in neurons and glia. As we've started looking at a whole variety of different tissues, PRPC is almost everywhere. So um, very ubiquitous. Interestingly, even though we've known about PRPC and since about 1985 or 1986, we still don't really know what it does. It appears to be involved in synapses, in um, cell-cell um, communication. There's a variety of um, proposed functions, but you can delete the prion protein in a mouse, knock it out, and the mouse is pretty much fine. Serves a little bit of um, abnormal behavior. There's some rumors that if you knock it out in, say, a cow, which has been done, that that cow has some issues. We haven't seen much of that data, so it's more a guess. So it's about 205 amino acids long. Um, it has both a signal peptide and a GPI signal. So the mature protein actually extends from partway through these metal binding uh, repeats uh, through to the GPI anchor sequence. So I put this in because I just think Personally, this is really cool. Um, my colleague at the Prion Center, Holger Billy, and his grad student, uh, Sarah Amadian, have been using molecular dynamics simulations to come up with the structures of prion, uh, the normal host prion. And um, these are what the PRPC from my deer looked like. Um, and we have different polymorphisms, and they all have very subtly different um, structures. Don't know what this means yet, but it is kind of fun to actually see your protein um, like for the first time ever. So what we think happens in prion replication, and again, the process isn't completely understood, is that we have PRPC. It misfolds, sometimes sporadically, sometimes with the input of um, infectious agent. It misfolds um, into a different structure. This structure can then cause the conversion of PRPC into PRPSC, and this is a self-replicating um, protein event. Um, you can get certain events that will then cause um, bits of the PRPSC to break off and act as new seed. 
And that's in essence what we're doing when we're infecting animals is taking that seed and just putting it in to self-propagate. So again, another structure of um, PRPC and as the transmission or the disease um, acute, uh, replicates, prions replicate, we get in some of the prion diseases, this deposition of prion aggregates. Um, we get the accumulation of PRPSC, and this is what we use all the time in the lab to look for prion infection. So if you run brain homogenate on a gel, um, you see in the infected animal, uh, you always see three bands. The protein has two glycosylation sites, so it allows us to see unglycosylated mono and diglycosylated protein. If the animal does not is not infected, then the uninfected PRP is um, sensitive to proteinase K, and it will give you a blank lane. So that's the easiest way for us to determine if an animal is infected or not. Run it on a gel. If you get PRP SC, um, it's infected. Um, Holger Billy's lab has done a lot of work on looking at the structure and have some really nice uh, figures of these long prion rods that are found um, in the brains of infected animals. And then in the last year or so, the structure of PRPSC has been, we think, solved. Um, they've been working on this for years. There's like literally dozens and dozens of models, but um, several different groups have now um, identified this structure. And again, just going from this, um, this structure, if you look at it in a specific way, then you see these parallel interregister intermolecular beta sheets. Um, we're not directly involved in this, but it's going to be really <laughs> exciting to be able to try to figure out what all these different structures mean. So to switch now specifically to chronic wasting disease, um, it's a disease of whitetail and mule deer, um, elk, moose. I've been really nervous. I was going to screw those up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so this, yes, I did. So um, this is what the pattern or the distribution of CWD looked like in North America in 2002. Um, there was um, game farms is the, the filled in states and provinces that had um, positive animals. And then there's a few little areas, the pink dots is where CWD was in the um, wild population. So 2002 was the first here in Wisconsin, 2000 was the first in Saskatchewan. This is the map from a couple of weeks ago, and this is what the distribution of CWD looks like now. Um, we always kind of said that there was three foci of CWD, the one in the Wisconsin, Illinois area, the original in Colorado and Wyoming, and then the Alberta, Saskatchewan one, but I'm not sure we can actually see see that there's distinct regions um, anymore. So it's now considered in four provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and we had a captive herd in Quebec a couple of years ago and in 31 states. It's also present in Northern Europe, um, it was identified there about seven years ago in Norway, and now cases have been found in Sweden and Finland as well. So this is uh, what CWD looks like in Saskatchewan. Um, this is from 2018 to 2020 in male mule deer. Um, the red is greater than 50% disease prevalence. In this area down here around the swift current, um, talking to the wildlife biologists in the government of Saskatchewan, they're above 88% now. 
the male mule deer bucks are positive and they're starting to see population declines. <coughs> Similar kinds of things, but not quite the same prevalence um, in Alberta. So this is from Alberta Environment Parks. In 2010, you can see we had a little bit of CWD spillover from Saskatchewan, but for the most part, prevalence was low. The highest we had was about 14% here. Uh, 2019, prevalence is much higher now on the Saskatchewan border, um, anywhere from 31 to 55% of the mule deer bucks are positive. Um, and this is just sort of an indication of what's happening with the disease. So on the left, are the number of the locations of positive animals from surveillance from 2005 to 2018. And the one on uh, the right are just the positives from 2019, or 2021, I'm sorry. Um, I started out getting positive samples um, from AEP um, back in about 2014 or so, 15, and we'd be lucky to get 30 samples a year. Um, in 2021, Margo Pivas from AEP called me up and she's like, I have 300 positives and we've still got, you know, we're not even a third of the way through. Do you want me to collect more? <laughs> no, I can't deal with more than 300 samples. So the routes of infection, with CWD um, are very different than what we see with a lot of the other prion diseases. In mad cow disease, the prion infection is pretty much localized to the central nervous system and the spinal cord, and there's no shedding of infectivity. Um, there's a little bit of infectivity in muscle and in lymph, but really not well distributed through the body. In deer, CWD prions are found in many different tissues. It is shed in antler velvet, nasal secretions, saliva, um, urine, feces, um, so any kind of open wound. And then these are then either transferred directly to another deer via uh, direct contact. We think the transmission route is oral, na oral nasal. Um, so contact um, any kind of you know um, saliva that would then um, be able to affect the next animal. Um, I'll talk about some of the other work later that we're doing, but we know that these prions are then ending up in this environment, that they're in obviously carcasses from infected animals but also um, the saliva and urine is then landing on the soil. It binds avidly to soil, it stays, um, binds to plants. Um, it can be, there's some evidence of degradation, but there's also evidence that it can persist for 10 years or more in the environment. So one of the things that we, so I don't know how to move that thing up. Um, one of the things that we started looking at a couple of years ago was some of the other glands, because we got interested in the behavioral aspects of CWD transmission and what else might be involved. So um, a colleague at the University of Winnipeg, Susan Lingle, and her students had collected um, glands from um, a huge number um, of animals at uh, CFB Wainwright, and then worked with us to analyze them. And an undergrad, Radna Jacob, who screened through literally 40 animals, seven or eight different uh, glands, just looking for PRPC. First question is, do we have PRPC? We can't make PRPSC without PRPC. So she did that. And then we've gone back and looked at some of these um, for the presence of the infectious protein. And what we found was that in the interdigital glands that are here in the foot of the deer, um, I don't know if you can see it from the back of the room, but there's really light pink staining um, in this gland, which demonstrates that there is infectious agent there. We don't know what that means. We went back then and um, looked at another 10 or 12 
um, deer feet, blinded, did the analyses, identif correctly identified which animals uh, were positive. Um, Anthony from the lab and Aradna have just, they spent three or four days out at TFB Wainwright in December, minus 25, cutting deer feet off at the hunt station. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that story. So the role of prion genetics. We showed um, back in 2000 or so, 2002, that there were polymorphisms in the prion protein gene in deer and that just looking at the population level, there was differences in the presence of these alleles in infected animals. Um, the two that we were primarily interested in were 95 and 96 in white-tailed deer um, with an underrepresentation of a um, 96 serine in infected animals. This was really interesting to us, but in the field, it's hard to get an idea of what the impact really is on susceptibility or resistance, because we have animals that were infected, who knows when, um, we don't know where they are in the disease, etc. So we had gone on and did um, a set of experimental transmissions. We had deer with a number of different PRP genotypes. Um, experimentally infected them orally with CWD prions. And as you can see, animals that had one specific genotype, the most common one came down very quickly. And then there was an increased time to infection for these others, supporting the idea that the sequence of the prion protein affects the uh, progression of disease. Interestingly, neither we or anyone else has found a specific polymorphism that provides resistance to disease. All of them slow down disease progression. Um, so from the experimental animals, just to um, as a quick aside, this is one of our healthy controls, uninfected, and this is a sick um, deer, um, a whole variety of different um, Clinical symptoms, most of which you wouldn't notice in the field. This is because uh, my grad student at the time, like literally spent a couple of hours a day um, observing these deer. So he picked up these subtle changes. So when we then started looking at these more carefully at the biochemical level, we saw that this one animal had a very long incubation period, had a very different profile of the prion protein, suggesting that it was a different strain. Um, one thing I should mention also before I go on is the little brown bars inside on these um, survival graphs, that's how long the clinical phase was. So for some of these, you can see it was much longer and then some, it took very little time from onset of disease until we had to euthanize. So the concept of CWD strains has been around for a long time. It was first described back in 1926 in sheep. And um, a lot of work was done from about 1926 well into the 80s, looking at the various strains, um, but at a very different level than we do it now because they didn't know about the prion protein. So this was all classic you know, transmission into from sheep into goats, sheep into mice, like they didn't put in the passage history, but literally like in decades of passage to get these strains figured out. So the strains by definition for prions um, have set characteristics that have to be stable with passage in a given host. So if you have two different strains and you are inoculating them into the same host, they have to have different, or they have to have stable incubation periods. They should um, have stable clinical signs and you can differentiate strains sometimes based on um, uh, the clinical signs of disease. When we look at the brains of the animals, the distribution of the infectious protein or the infectivity should be in different places. Um, the 
electrophoretic mo mobility of the PRP SC should be different. And I showed you that on the previous slide. Sometimes we see differences in the glycosylation patterns. And other times we'll see differences in their sensitivity to proteinase K. So some of them you can treat with a little bit of proteinase K and most of the infectious protein disappears. Other ones, we have one strain that we've hit with PK for like three weeks and it's still there. So very, very resistant. So we'd always kind of hypothesized that there was going to be a number of different strains um, in the cervids because we have these three different areas where CWD is developing. We have different populations. So Wisconsin has only white-tailed deer. So the passaging of the agent is going to be different than, say, in Colorado and Wyoming, where CWD is prevalent in white-tails, muleys, elks, and moose. Here, it's mostly in muleys, but there's going to be uh, some differences then in the prion protein structure, and that's going to affect the passage history and the development of strains. We can characterize these um, a whole number of different ways, and I'm not going to go through all of these because everybody would just fall asleep in 30 seconds, other than to say, I've talked about Western blots already. Uh, we have a uh, organotypic slice culture um, that Val Sims Labs using. Um, we can do neuropathology and we can do um, procedures in vitro assays that are called real-time quaking induced conversion, which is just a way of generating prions um, in a test tube. We can also characterize strains by moving them into our rodent panels. And over the last 13 years, uh, between uh, myself and particularly Sabina Gilch at the University of Calgary, we have this really nice panel um, that we can inoculate animals and then we wait for them to get sick. And by looking, comparing host range, what animals do they go in, which ones do they not, we can start to differentiate different strains. One thing I should say with doing the animal this is all transgenic mice. Um, one thing that's really cool with prions is that if we take a mouse and we knock out the mouse prion protein gene, we put in a deer prion protein gene, it's now susceptible to deer prions. If we put in human prion protein and infected with human prions, it's gonna transmit, but it may not go into the original mouse itself, which we can definitely use to our advantage. So as of now, um, we and um, various um, colleagues in the CWD field have isolated at least um, seven different CWD strains. And these are ones that have been fully characterized with respect to host range, um, biochemistry, et cetera. Uh, we also have a number of elk agents that have um, they look different on a Western block. That's not quite enough to call them a strain yet. They still have to do the full workup. And as we started looking at hunter harvested samples from um, Alberta and Saskatchewan, we're seeing all kinds of variations, uh, which is suggesting that there's a lot of strain variability out there. So why is this important? Because different strains can have a different host range. And in the lab, we can show this by transmitting uh, two of our deer strains, uh, WISC-1 and X95, <coughs> into hamsters and just regular lab mice. And what we found, which kind of surprised us at the time, was WISC-1, which came from these particular deer, um, infects hamsters, but there's no infection of mice. But then when we looked at the other strain, which was H95, it clearly infects C56 black, C56, C57 black six, I always get that wrong, um, mice, but it is, does not particularly go into hamsters. So it's just it's indicative that there can be um, different host ranges um, 
which then on a more global picture starts to be a concern. And so there's been a lot of questions as to what other species can be infected. Um, data right now suggests that CWD probably doesn't go into big cats. Um, there's been some nice work by Mike Miller in Wyoming, Colorado, uh, looking at that. Um, we do know that it goes into voles. Um, it's actually the shortest animal model we have for prion diseases, our voles. Um, Justin Greenlee in Ames, Iowa is just showing that raccoons are susceptible. So then we started asking questions about what about beaver and pronghorn antelope that would share range with um, the various cervid species. Whoops. Whoa, that was <coughs> so one of the things that we did in collaboration with Dave Westaway is that we generated some beaver mice. So these are transgenic mice that are expressing beaver PRP. Um, we, uh, Alan Herbst, when he was in the lab, basically took every prion agent we had in the freezer and put them into the mice. And to our surprise, all of the beaver mice got sick, no matter what strain we put in, with one exception. Human prions don't go into beavers, but everything else does. So we definitely, um, it suggests that CWD could be transmitted into beaver. And interestingly, it suggests that there are, um, it can also differentiate different strains. Um, the jury's still out on the pronghorn antelope, the mice are infected, but these um, experiments, as you can see from these incubation periods, can take a long time. And we're about 300 days in, and we'll know in the next month or so um, if antelope are gonna be susceptible. So one of the reasons that this is important is from work that Jason Bartz, um, is a graduate student in the lab back in the 90s, did some really nice work where he had taken some CWD mule deer agent and tried to transmit it into our hamster model and it didn't go. But then he adapted it into ferrets. Ferrets are also susceptible to a variety of different prion diseases. And once he got it um, stably adapted to the ferret, that ferret agent goes back into hamsters. So you can change the host range. And so this then means with something like CWD, and if we passage it, and this is very hypothetical, if we passage it through beavers or antelope or some metal voles, um, that we could be potentially changing the host range. And now it could be a problem for livestock um, and you know, a whole variety of other animals. So I just want to finish up talking a little bit about CWD prions in the environment. Um, I mentioned that the deer um, shed prions through saliva, urine, and um, feces. There was a nice study by Mike Miller many years ago where he put deer into paddocks that either had infected deer in them, an infected carcass, um, just um, residential excretia from animals that have been there two and a half years earlier, and then some, another paddock that was unexposed. And as you can see, within a couple of years, animals start getting sick. So if they have other animals in there, clearly they're going to get sick. We see this always with captive herds. Captive herds, if they're not um, depopulated, it's not unusual to find 85 to 90 percent of the animals infected. There's a huge um, problem in captive herds and anything with direct contact. But I think that it was the, you know, that there's stuff in the environment that will allow for this transmission. So we showed a number of years ago that prions bind to soil. They bind really avidly to clay minerals in soil. It's almost impossible to get them back off. And um, sandy soils are different. It doesn't bind very well to sand. Uh, but all of that was work that was being done with spike samples, taking soil samples and adding prions and then seeing if we could detect it. <coughs> in the last two years, um, El Sue in the lab has been collecting environmental samples, 
Um, she spent a lot of time uh, this last summer collecting samples from North Dakota and Saskatchewan. Um, in Saskatchewan, it was great. We had information from trail cameras. We knew exactly where deer had been um, uh, congregating. We knew even where infected deer had been found. Um, so she was able to really target the areas where she was collecting samples. And she would collect five or six subsamples um, from every area that she was collecting. She used a method then called PMCA, where you take uh, PRPC from an uninfected brain homogenate and mix it with, for example, the soil sample extract. You, if you sonicate it, let it rest, sonicate it again, you can amplify it. So it's sort of like the prion way, um, uh, PCR for prions kind of thing. And you can then take your amplified material and put it back in and do rounds of amplification. And when we do that, we see the numbers here indicate the different um, areas that she collected. So Saskatchewan 16, Saskatchewan 17, et cetera. And you can see that we have a few samples that are actually positive. Um, so this was really exciting after many years of doing this in the lab. Um, it's there. It's really there in the environment. What we're working on now is trying to determine how much inf infectivity this represents. Is this going to be sufficient? If a deer eats five grams of soil, is that enough to get infected? So that's where that uh, project is currently. Uh, one thing that was of interest is a couple of the places she collected samples from in 2022, she had also collected in 2021, still infectivity. So we're slowly, we're going to go back to those places year after year now and try to get an indication of how long infectivity stays in the soil. Um, can't, again, can't see my, my title, but um, CWD um, also combined to plants. Um, we're still at the point that we're looking at finding um, in lab settings, so taking plants, putting prions on the leaves or in the soil, and then monitoring what happens at that point. And we're basically now looking at um, taking the various plants after it's dried on the, the leaf, washing it off, and then analyzing is it bound or unbound, fairly simple experiments, but CWD does bind oops, to um, a variety of different um, plants. And so we're hoping this next summer to start applying those um, methods to looking at crops and various um, deer browse. Um, we're also looking at uptake into plants it's a little bit more complicated, but a group in Texas a couple of years ago has data that suggests that prions can move from the soil up through the roots into the inside of the plant. Um, and there's no way of degrading that, which is kind of unsettling if you start thinking it all the way through. Um, so what else has come up with is sort of a model is that if you take prions, CWD prions, um, in boreal areas where the soils tend to be more loamy, um, we know that prions will bind to lichens, but they will eventually migrate through the soil column. And we have some really nice soil, col soil column experiments showing that. But in the prairie region where the, uh, their soil is more clay, then uh, prions will wash out of grasses to some extent, but then they sit right at the cell surface. And when we do soil column studies, we can't find it even a centimeter into the column. Like it really stays right on the surface. So it'd be really super available for cattle or deer or any other animal to ingest. So CWD is sort of, because of all of the aspects of the biochemistry, and the biology of is having, I think, widespread ramifications um, on not just deer, but on, on the environment and on humans. So the fact that we have infectivity in saliva, feces, and urine uh, means that this is a contagious disease. It's the most contagious prion disease that we know of. 
Um, we know that we have animal to animal transmission, but we also have animal to environment to animal. And this is gonna be problematic long-term because as people are trying to develop vaccines, et cetera, to mitigate CWD spread, even if we stop it in the deer, we have to figure out how to get it out of the environment. In South Korea, where they've had CWD in farms, they literally dug up the top six inches of topsoil and then torched it and then treated it with lye to try to get rid of it. They put animals back in. We don't know if they're going to get sick, but that's clearly not the way to deal with CWD in all of the areas in North America where it's now endemic. This long incubation period, um, it's at least two years. It can be four or five years. So the animals are moving and shedding infectivity. Um, I didn't show you the map, but in Saskatchewan, the northern most endemic areas of CWD now overlap with caribou. So, and there doesn't appear to be any genetic barrier. We know that reindeer can be infected and experimentally caribou can be infected. So now we have potentially have infected caribou spreading prions over, you know, literally hundreds to thousands of kilometers compared to the smaller ranges of the other cervids. This extended preclinical period, it's been problematic. I think it's one of the reasons that game farms end up being infected. They move animals that look healthy. We have no anti-mortem tests. We can only guarantee that if your animal is infected, it's dead. Um, so people have been removing animals all over the place. Animals escape. There's this great story from Wisconsin just before we left where there was a game farm that had positive animals trying to depopulate. The guy threw up every legal barrier. They finally were able to depopulate only because his fences weren't high enough, nothing to do with having a positive animal. They went in, his herd was 87% positive by the time it was depopulated. But the night before, Something happened and 40 of his top um, males disappeared. He said that somehow there was a breach in the fence. My colleagues with the government said there was truck tracks up to the fence and a slice. But that means that out of those 40 animals, 87% of them were likely infected and they were just being moved elsewhere. And sometimes just open to let them, let them go. Um, no treatment, cure. Um, the genetics is an interesting one that we're still exploring. There doesn't appear to be resistance. There's no resistant deer. Um, we've got an ongoing experiment right now um, with Sabina Gilch in Calgary, and we're looking at if we take and use the polymorphism that takes longer for the animals to get sick. So it, it like slows disease progression. Does that slow shed? Because maybe it's not better to breed for animals that take longer to get sick if they're just shedding prions into the environment for another year or two. Um, talked about the strains. Um, how they have different characteristics, they have different host ranges. It actually can play a role in detection because as I mentioned, the protonase K sensitivity is a standard component of the testing. If you treat with too much PK, you're destroying some of the positive samples um, and we can't identify them. Um, and it, right now it's always fatal. So there's reports from Colorado and Wyoming of decreases in cervid populations. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Saskatchewan is now starting to see population declines as well. So with that, um, thanked everybody in the lab. I'd also like to thank a lot of the people that I've worked with over the years, Judd and Sabina, uh, Sammy as a postdoc in Sabina's lab, Herman Schatzel in Calgary, um, Marco Pibus, I don't think anything that I've done since I've been here could have been done without Margo, who's always been very generous with, with samples. 
Trent Bollinger in Saskatchewan was the person that helped us find the specific soil samples. He's got great trail cameras and lots of great data on where infected animals have been. Um, don't know, I need to say too much about most of the others. Uh, Melinda from uh, Ailes has been helping us with plants, providing us with um, all of our clover and alfalfa. And um, Charlie Bonson from North Dakota has been great um, helping us get samples and um, actually um, providing us with a very nice um, grant to look at soil persistence. And these are um, the other funding agencies. And so, thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie, for that. Um, the floor is open for questions, and we may have questions online as well. So I might just open up the chat and see uh, see what pops up there. Okay, I won. Because I got three questions. Um, first question. Uh, and thank you for that terrifying talk. Is that <laughs> CWDB transmitted from mother to offspring, or is there something that is you know, preventing it from being transmitted no, across the No, the there's system? evidence. Um, uh, the group in Colorado State shown that there could be uh, maternal um, transfer via the placenta to the, to the embryo. Okay. Second question. Uh, are people testing whether uh, carrion feeding insects or just nuisance flies that like to feed on saliva or eye secretions if they can spread it themselves? There's been a little bit of work done on that. There was um, a couple of groups have looked at mites. Um, one of the ones that was interesting and we, we tried to look at at one point were bot flies. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the tissues that can have a lot of infectivity in it is the tonsil. And apparently if you harvest a deer, um, when you're dressing it, the, the tonsil area, like pot flies come flying out of the, but, but because of their life cycle and I can't, this was stuff we did about 15 years ago, so I can't quite remember, but it seems like the, the larvae are in and they, use the tonsil as a protein source and then the flies are released. And we collected a handful of bot flies, but probably not enough to, to identify. But it's definitely something that makes some sense. We did some work with earthworms a bunch of years ago and it suggested that earthworms could potentially digest prions. Um, but that was stuff we did in Wisconsin. When we got here, we couldn't repeat it. And I don't know if we just had different earthworms or, you know, they were, um, so that's, we've also looked at things like domestic beetles thinking, you know, they're carrying, you know, they're cleaning carcasses so they would be infected and we couldn't identify anything. But, well, I think yeah. I've taken up enough questions. If nobody else asked the one I want, I'll ask them. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it looks like Mark, and then there was Dan Doretta online. So, Mark? So, <clears throat> we've had CWD in Wyoming and Colorado for 35 years, and um, we still have deer in Colorado and Wyoming, even in even Fort Collins area and, and uh, South uh, 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 Laramie area, where, where there have been pretty heavy in infections. And, and indeed, there's been a decline in abundance. We haven't lost the deer. And my, I guess my question is, it seems um, that density depend, there's a density dependent process that would allow deer and CWD to persist indefinitely. We're not yeah, going yeah. to lose our deer. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting because the prevalence in, in the Laramie area has never got as high as some of these other areas. And I don't know if it's just, it's density based, if it's, you know, maybe, maybe like the area around Swift Current is just prime deer. And so they end up having, you know, more offspring. 
sort of an anecdotal thing was in Wisconsin, we, when we first got there in the early 80s, we rarely saw does with more than a single fawn. And then as the CWD prevalence increased, um, we saw fewer deer when they were herding up, but we saw you know, then more twins. And by the time we left in 2018, we were seeing triplets. Like not, it wasn't, you know, you normally it's like, oh my God, she's got three, you know, and it's like drive off the road excitement. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, another three. So I don't know, you know, if there's, you know, if you're in, in prime territory for, for deer that they can just, I don't. Or, or alternatively, if it's poor habitat, they'll be so widely dispersed that it's highly improbable yeah. that they'll be right, it up. right, right. Yeah. So I think it's the other thing that's changing, and I think it's one thing that's hard to get a handle on, is that the initial transmissions are probably more deer to deer. And then what's happening like in the swift current area is that as prevalence increases, now the soil and the environment is so heavily contaminated. So if the deer density is low, then there's not gonna be a lot of CWV in the environment. And it's gonna be a little harder to sustain the infection. But as the number of animals increases, now it becomes environment to animal and prevalence rates are like you know, increasing exponentially. But Okay, so uh, Anna has a question. What drives the adaptation example through roles? Is it a non-classical change in trojan structure that now facilitates transmission to species that would not have been affected previously? That is a great question, and it's a really difficult one to answer because we don't know enough yet about the structures of PRPSC to know what the differences in structure are and to understand how, we know that if you have homologous conversion, so PRPC from um, a white-tailed deer in, being infected with PRPSC from a white-tailed deer, then the infection goes better than if you're crossing species kind of thing. So like kind of like, um, it's one of the things I think is really good for all of us is that there's a really high species barrier with humans and anything else. If human to human trans conversion will occur, but another agent doesn't, even in, in the test tube doesn't convert human. So when you have heterologous, you start changing. We think that there's then a number of different confirmations that are generated of the infectious protein, and then it sort of selects inside of the tube for the one that it likes best, and then that's what gets amplified. Does that kind of answer it, Dan? It does, thank you. My <laughs> Um, thank you for the very interesting talk. I'm wondering about the infection in scent glands um, and whether there could be any evidence that prions manipulate the scents that are actually produced to make them more attractive to, uh, to increase transmission. I have no idea. We, we found this in those interdigital glands like less than a year ago. So we haven't, we just haven't known what's released by the, by, by the compounds, no? Um, I'm sure they are, but, you know, and I know that they're very much involved in some of the types of scent marking yeah. that, that deer do, but I don't know if it, it changes them. Okay. In your okay. farm and or your wild animals, do you think it could be transmitted through water? Potentially. There's a single report in the literature of taking water samples um, from um, an area where there was contaminated, a contaminated farm, and they found CWD in the water. Um, but I don't, it, that's been done, done once, and it was really tiny amounts, which is maybe not, you know, if it's in a river system, it's hard to imagine um, how much. CWD, you know, would have to get into the water to be 
to be detectable downstream. But it could be, you know, if you start thinking about carcasses, you know, an animal dies and it ends up in the water, then um, it would definitely be there. Uh, just a quick question. Do, do you see evidence of trophic transmission from the ungulates to the carnivores in the wild? Not yet, but we don't. We don't have a good idea of where else CWD might be in the environment, just because deer are easy because they're hunted. And so it's easy to do surveillance. Um, we sort of have these ongoing discussions about, you know, if you're out hiking somewhere and you see a dead beaver or a dead bighorn sheep, you know, do you think that that's unusual? And would you report it? to have somebody come and test it, you know? And so I think my understanding is, is that the province tests things sporadically if they find a dead animal, but most of those other species aren't routinely surveyed. And even early on, um, you know, the first couple of years with all of the, the Alberta Environment and Parks, it, we had five positives, 15 positives out of this six or 7,000 animals that were tested. So I think there really is hard to find those. You know, we predict that it would go, for example, CWD goes into sheep, so it should go into uh, Rocky Mountain goats and bighorn sheep if they were so exposed to the appropriate levels. So, but we haven't, we don't have direct evidence. Okay. Well, with that, I'd like to say, Thank you very much, Debbie, for a fantastic talk today. Thank you, Billy. I'd like to uh, offer up a, a token of our appreciation. Uh, what about? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking. Still, you do want to go ahead with that? I think that. Uh, why are you going to use the piece of land? I want to go ahead and do the conservation piece then. Uh, let me know when I can yeah, touch with the little